15 minute or less lecture series in anatomy and physiology, chapter three, cells, part one. Cells are the basic unit of life. All living things are made of at least one cell, just tiny bacteria, or many, many cells like the animals and plants we all know and love. The cell has three main components. It has the cell membrane, structure that separates the cells insides from the outside world. It has the nucleus, the structure that houses the genetic material, the DNA, and the cytoplasm, which is everything between the nucleus and the cell membrane. The cell is, membrane is made up primarily of a double layer of phospholipid molecules, two layers of phospholipids with millions, maybe billions of phospholipids in the cell membrane, separating the extracellular side from the cytoplasmic side. The phospholipid has a hydrophobic fatty cells, acid tails, and also a hydrophilic phosphate head. Hydrophobic doesn't dissolve in water, hydrophilic does dissolve. So phospholipids are amphipathic. They are both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Because of this, the hydrophobic phosphate groups making the up the head face out toward the aqueous solutions inside or outside of a cell. And the hydrophobic tails come together to avoid the solution and form a hydrophobic barrier. This barrier allows the cell membrane to have selective permeability. Some materials can cross through the membrane, such as water, while other materials cannot pass through, such as really large molecules or charged molecules. There are other structures in the cell membrane. These include proteins. There are integral proteins that are embedded partially in the cell membrane or pass completely through. The ones that pass completely through are transmembrane proteins. And there are peripheral proteins that are bound to the surface of the cell membrane. Some other structures are uh, glycolipids. These are fatty acid chains that are attached to a carbohydrate group or glycoproteins, proteins that have carbohydrate groups attached to them. And these carbohydrates are usually facing or the outside, the extracellular side. Embedded within the cell membrane are cholesterol molecules. Cholesterol molecules are uh, also hydrophobic, so they are there inter intercalated with the fatty acid chains of the uh, phospholipids, and they're important because they help increase the cell's rigidity. Turns out that the cell membrane is very dynamic. Everything in it is moving around constantly, all the time. And sometimes proteins that have similar functions uh, will group together and uh, float as a unit on what are called lipid rafts. There are many functions for the cell membrane proteins. One is transport. Some proteins act as channels that allow materials to pass through the cell membrane that perhaps don't normally do that. These cell membrane proteins can also connect to each other on neighboring cells. So these two cells with interconnected proteins connecting the cells together. The uh, proteins can also act as an anchorage site for the cytoskeleton. Cytoskeleton is important for giving the cell its structure and shape and needs to be able to bind to these proteins, then thereby connecting it to the cell membrane. The uh, proteins can also act in cell cell recognition. So those carbohydrate groups can be recognized by our immune cells so that our immune cells will not attack our own cells. This becomes very relevant when it talk about blood types later on. Signal transduction. Some transmembrane proteins act as a receptor. They'll have something bind to it, such as a hormone. And when that binding occurs, it will then signal other proteins to engage in a lot of various chemical reactions that basically cause an effect inside of the cell. Some materials can cross the cell membrane. Many of these move by passive transport. Passive transport means they are moving either along the concentration gradient, going from high concentration to low, or along the electrical gradient, where, a, say, a negative charged uh, molecule will move to a positive area, or a positive charged molecule will move to a negatively charged area. And this is great because it requires no energy. So here is, say, a drop of dye put into a beaker of water. The dye is highly concentrated in the drop, low concentrated in the surrounding water. It will rapidly start to diffuse out from the high concentrated area and eventually will diffuse and be evenly distributed throughout the solution. 
Again, with selective permeability, some materials can pass through the cell membrane. Things that can pass through via diffusion include small lipid soluble materials that can then pass through that hydrophobic barrier through diffusion. While uh, water is another substance that can pass through the cell membrane, going from high concentration to low concentration. This specific type of diffusion is called osmosis. When you look at a solution, you see that it is made up of the solvent water and solutes, anything that dissolves in the water. The ideal kind of solution for our cells to be in is a isotonic solution. This means the solution outside of the cell has the same amount of materials dissolved in it as the fluid inside of the cell. And because of this, water will be going into and out of the cell at the same rate. There will be no net change in movement of water. Sometimes a cell might find itself in a hypotonic solution. Hypotonic solution is very dilute compared to inside of the cell. So there's more water outside than inside. The water will enter the cell, causing it to swell, and in some cases, even lice or burst, killing the cell. Sometimes cells are in hypertonic solutions. Here, the solution outside of the cell is very highly concentrated in solutes. So little water outside, lots of water inside, the water will leave the cell. This net movement of water will cause the cell to shrivel or crenate, and this can also kill the cell. Another form of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. With facilitated diffusion, there is a transmembrane protein acting as a channel that lets a specific substance move from high concentration to low concentration. All right, here is some examples of problems involving solutions in the movement of water. So here we have a dialysis bag filled with 1% starch solution and it is floating in a beaker filled with 5% starch solution. The inside of the bag is hypotonic compared to outside, and the outside is hypertonic compared to inside. The outside has more stuff dissolved in it. So water will leave the dialysis bag. So water is going to go to the hypertonic solution. It's going to go where there is more stuff dissolved in the water. Here's another example. We have a dialysis bag with 10% sodium chloride solution in a beaker filled with 1% sodium chloride solution. So the solution outside in the beaker compared to inside is hypotonic. The solution inside the dialysis tubing compared to outside is hypertonic. So water is going to move in to the bag, going from either high concentration of water to low concentration of water, or as I said earlier, going toward the hypertonic solution, going toward where there's more stuff dissolved in. Filtration is another passive way that materials can move. Here, you have different forces, such as pressure, acting on moving small molecules through little holes. So for instance, in our blood capillaries, there is a certain amount of blood pressure in the blood capillaries. It is higher than the pressure in the tissue fluid surrounding the capillary. So this higher pressure will push small things through little gaps between the cells. So small materials can leave the capillaries while larger materials such as cells and proteins stay in. There's active transport. Active transport is the movement of materials against the concentration gradient, so going from low concentration to high, or against the electrical gradient. Having a negative molecule go to a negative area, or a positive molecule go toward a positive area. And this always requires energy. So for example, we can have transmembrane proteins that with the use of ATP as an energy source can move materials from low concentration to high concentration. Again, ATP is the energy currency that the cell uses. There's also bulk transport where the cell uses a lot of energy to change structures to form vesicles to either move things in or out. Using a vesicle to move things out of the cell is called exocytosis. Using vesicles to move things into the cell is endocytosis. Here's an example of exocytosis. A vesicle is formed inside the cell. It then migrates to the cell membrane, fuses with the cell membrane, 
and then releases its contents into the extracellular fluids. Endocytosis comes in three main forms. There's phagocytosis. This is where a large structure or solid is brought into the cell. The cell membrane will form these pseudopods that wrap around the target material until eventually forming a vesicle which pinches off of the cell membrane and into the cell. Phenocytosis is where the cell forms vesicles filled with the fluid surrounding the cell. So it's just sampling the fluids outside of the cell, bringing it in in the form of vesicles. And then receptor-mediated endocytosis is where there are many receptor molecules bound to the surface of the cell membrane. And when those receptor molecules bind to their target structure, then if enough of them are bound up, that area of the cell membrane will then invaginate inwards and form a vesicle inside the cell, helping to get special materials that the cell may find very valuable but difficult to find. Receptor-mediated endocytosis can be hijacked by viruses. Viruses could bind to those receptors, pretending to be the desired substance, tricking the cell to bring it in, where the virus will then take over the cell's functions to produce many, many more viruses. All right, that was part one. I hope you enjoyed it.